All right, we're back live. And thank you, Tyler, for supporting DEF CON, supporting the community, supporting the Red Team Village. In order to have you here. And with that said, without any further ado, take it away. Okay. Hey, good evening, late night DEF CON. This is 50 Shades of Pseudo Abuse. I'm Tyler Boykin, and this will be my talk. <clears throat> So we'll cover, do a quick about, um, and the intended audience level for this kind of thing is, you know, it's beginner to intermediate, and there's plenty of talks on some whiz, some cool advanced stuff, right? But uh, just figured we hit it, keep it in the beginner intermediate, intermediate range, or if you're a more seasoned professional, you know, you may pick up a few things, maybe a good refresher. You know, we'll do a, a brief kind of crash course on pseudo, on uh, where it stands on the TTP, you know, the MITRE kind of, realm of things and then we'll cover the sudoers file and then we'll hit up some uh, enumeration and recon and, and then we'll go into the fun stuff which are all the examples so uh, a little bit about me i'm a aggie communications officer with the marine corps uh cut my teeth with network engineering and information assurance and then now i do security engineering for biolite professional it services and so you can find me on twitter and a few other places Okay, so super user do, you know, whether you're calling it sudo or sudo, whatever, we're talking about the same thing, right? And it's basically, it allows you, any permitted user to execute, execute commands as another intended user. Typically, 90% of the time, you're, it's going to be root, right? And the security policy, which is what we'll dive into as we're going into this, is to, determines what privileges, what allocations, what all can that user do um and the whereupon authentication um specific token uh tokens are made on the you know pseudo tracks uh each and every failed or successful uh, authentication and uh and it'll remember you for five minutes so if you ever notice that and then so on and so when you execute a command, uh, and you'll see this later on too, unlike SU, um, as you were, the security policy to states which, uh, ex which environment you get. So whenever you, you are actually running sudo, you inherit all of that users in full environmental variables, for instance, you know, you get the, unless it's uh, explicitly stated otherwise. So you typically get their environment variables. You'll get uh, a variety of IDs, right? And unless you, you know, state unless you specify otherwise. You know, your real effective user IDs, group IDs, right? You get a you get a good variety of, of things up there, but it's as the target user. And so, and this is straight out of this, and these are straight out of the pseudo man pages. I'm just going, you know, inch deep, mile wide uh, stuff, just to kind of give a little bit of a background. Uh, there is no easy way, right? There is no easy way, and this is to prevent a user, you know, malicious user from, you know, escalating, you know, abusing stuff if there are, if stuff is allocated, simply because there's a the whole breadth of things are, uh, there's just the breadth of applications and features that can be manipulated maliciously. You know, it's just, it gets kind of, it gets rather hard. And so, I mean, there are ways to mitigate this, you know, you enforce uh, at least you've really cranked down on the least privileged kind of, uh, kind of method of, of security and whatnot, but it's really, you have to be particularly uh, stringent when allocating stuff. Okay, so we'll kind of uh, shift gears here into MITRE. And so it falls under uh, abuse elevation control. So this shouldn't be anything new, right? This is, I mean, this is pretty similar vernacular to what we've been talking about the past couple of minutes. May, you know, adversaries may circumvent mechanisms, you know, designed to control and elevate privileges to higher level and so on. And so where the pseudo and the pseudo pseudoers falls into is now the new format, which they went to sub techniques. And I'll give you all a quick minute to read that. I think I'll got it. No, I'm just kidding. So if basically it says the same thing, um, adversaries may perform pseudo caching and that's to where they have, they go after those uh, token those uh, token files, uh, and each user, and so in the directory, each user that attempts to authenticate via sudo gets their own specific directory, right? And then each 
attempt has its own little file. It's kind of cool. And then so adversaries may attempt to abuse um, the caching or misconfigurations in pseudoers, in which that is where you'll actually wind up seeing um, you'll actually you'll wind up seeing a lot of the stuff for all this talk are mostly out of pseudoers misconfigurations. Okay, and that's a good segue. So pseudoers, uh, it's the primary, the primary configuration file when you're working with pseudos. With pseudo, um, you know, it resides in Etsy. Um, technically, you can edit edit it with whatever you want to. That is not encouraged because it is it is very syntax picky. So generally speaking, uh, you make a copy of it and you use vi sudo. Uh, and if you use vi sudo to edit the file, right, it'll it'll run the error checking, the syntax checking immediately upon exit. Or you can just let's say if you wanted to tweak something, mess with something, you can always just run the standalone checker on the file. So, and then, so that's what it's basically going to look like. You're going to have, um, that when it, if you make a misconfiguration anywhere in pseudoers, it'll yell at you uh, like that. And then, and if you're good, then it tells you, okay. So the pseudoers uh, is the, specifies the who, what, when, where. It's the be all end all. Other documents can kind of contribute to this whole security or this whole policy, but the main config point of configuration, excuse me, is pseudoers. Right. And so, unlike um, by default, password authentication is required, but you can specify no password. And but unlike SU, where you authenticate as the user, which you are trying to do stuff as, so let's say root, you have to authenticate as root. Uh, sudo, you know, using sudoers, uh, you authenticate as the user calling it, right? And so it's a little bit less. And so the file is composed of two main parts. It has some other sections too, but for, for I mean, and you can go into a little bit more detail about that, but for the purposes of, of what we're doing here, right, you're going to have your aliases, which are kind of like variables and placeholders, right? And then, um, and then uh, you have your user specs, which are the five W's, you know, and there's quite a few user specs. And for these examples, um, and so when multiple entries stack up, you know, they're applied in order. You see that a lot in user specs. And then if there's, and then it racks and stacks into the last one. Okay. So aliases, uh, the interesting thing is that the syntax on the man pages are actually a little less, when you see them in a pseudo file, it kind of makes sense because stuff, right? But the, the format kind of, eh. But essentially it's alias type, name, and then you go on and you can specify whatever you're trying to alias. And then you have your defaults that you can always set to. And so moving on a little bit, the uh, pseudo allows for shell, shell style globs and wildcards, you know, it's not actual regex, but I mean, if you've ever done anything in bash or shell or whatever, right, it, it's similar in functionality. Uh, an asterisk, you know, uh, is one or more. And then question mark is in any single character. Uh, you can kind of do range, kind of splitting between brackets and so on. But this isn't, it's not actual regex, but it functions similar to what you see in bash or any kind of shell. Okay, so we're down to the user specs. And this is actually a little bit more of the intuitive part, in my opinion, uh, because it basically, it's the who, what, when, where. You have the who, where, in the parentheses, you have the as whom, and you can use col colons to delineate further detail of, you know, of, into that, right? And then the what. And then sandwiched between the what are tag specs that kind of throw stipulations on some of the activities on how it's done. And we'll go into that with the next slide or two. And so the run as spec, so for example, me at server, me at host server, you know, as operator, these commands. It's not too wet. 
And so tag spec, and this is what I was talking about earlier, it sandwiches in between the as whom and the command part, right? And this can either greatly, drastically make, you know, a red, a red teamer's life easier, or it can make it a little bit more difficult, make it more complicated. Um, no password, you'll see sometimes. Uh, set in will also, you can deliberately manipulate the environment when you're calling those commands. And no exec prevents dy you know, DLL, uh, dynamically linked applications from actually calling shell on themselves or running commands themselves, you know? So let's say, and there's, we have an example of that later on also, but I'm uh, gonna hope for that no password, so much easier. Okay, so enumeration. So there's manually, right? You have sudo l, uh, and if you're lucky, and you know this could be for any kind of real world pen testing, CTFs could be for any type of thing, right? Uh, you have sudo l, and it might be as easy as that. The user that you may have compromised may be a sudoers, and when you do sudo l, you may get a listing of every you know, what all that user can do, right? You have Etsy sudoers. Uh, it should, hopefully it exists. Uh, if you can read it as an unprivileged user, I think there are bigger things going on or you're in a CTF, you know, but I mean, that would help you help enumerate and get a bigger picture of things. Uh, in the event that you cannot, for instance, let's say you can't do sudo, but you're still trying to look at version numbers or whatever else, you can still get the version of number from sudo. Uh, with capital B and just do some Googling. You know, you maybe you can find a user or service that can't use sudo, and then you may be able to leverage that for exploitation. Uh, Etsy group. And so, but same thing, you can see additional users that may be in, you know, the sudo -verse group. And then one of the one of the places it logs is to var log for off log. And so, and that's all, man, that's all manual stuff. Um, and generally, speak, and generally speaking, uh, because this is a, a subset of privilege escalation, so you don't need as, as much expansive tools and resources to really enumerate what you have, per se. You know, like, let's say if you're doing some other things. But there are automated things. Uh, for MSF, you know, you have post modules. Uh, I think Interpreter has a few also. And then there's some pretty well-known scripts, too, like Linenum, anybody who's done, like, CTFs. And some other things have you has used Linenum. That's a pretty well known one. Uh, Fall of Pseudo is actually pretty neat, also. And I, I make another reference to uh, to the, to the creators of that. And uh, that particular one in the middle references that for that particular CVE. And so, yep. okay. So examples. So this is from you know the creator fall pseudo and it's and this is more the, the degree of examples because it's it's kind of a spectrum right and i like to use i use to use the fruit the hanging fruit kind of analogies right so the first the two examples a complete lack of configuration right it's nothing wide open it's low hanging fruit right that's the lowest hanging fruit and you should go for the lowest hanging fruit first because that those are the gimmicks Everything you or you might see a you know they've tried to configure secure uh, sets of rules you know but it, there may be a bug in one of the applications uh, it may be some flag or they just didn't know you know and so but they're trying and or this may not be configured consistently throughout whatever they're doing right and so which is actually pretty normal for any other kind of real uh, real system hardening and whatnot. You, know, you get the lobes to the fruit, you get the open pseudo, and then you got the top part, which is the fairly secure, as he's mentioning. But for today's purposes, we're going to be mostly resolving, uh, residing mostly in the middle. You'll have a little bit of low fruit, and we'll have a little bit of uh, the cool stuff up at the top. But the middle is going to be that's where the fun playground is because it's a little bit gamier, in my opinion. Okay, so uh, when you're doing this, and you know, you want to get creative and inventive because you, you don't necessarily when you're you don't necessarily have to uh, get it get it like a fancy CVE per se with these. You know, you don't have to you don't have to alpha make an alphanumeric freaking rock chain, you know, or anything like that. It's you're just using what exists. 
creatively. And so that's kind of the cool part about it, you know, and can you read something off limits? You know, can you write to something? If you can write to something, then you can go even, you can go really for then, right? Can you, you know, are there, you're, this is where you're scouring the man pages, right? And you're looking for uh, flags. You're looking for little subtle things that may be kind of useful. And so that's why it's more, and that's why it's more fun, you know, and uh, it's kind of a misnomer escalate laterally you may be able to move laterally you know i haven't really seen uh, any non root users uh specified at sudoers but that's an option you can do sudo as a different user you know and so but if use using that gets you to a different user i mean that's worth a uh, mention on a pen test report right and that may get you to something bigger and better it's not always about up and down sideways works too right and so with that, we are now entering low hanging fruit. So this is the easy stuff, open sudo, the classic example, right? Wide open user authenticates as himself, uh, his or herself, whatever. Uh, and then um, the, the system is their oyster, right? They're one step, they're keystrokes away from root. And so you go into a little bit more, uh, so these, any um, applications that directly result in a shell, you know, they're they're pretty much right next to there. You know, this is your your SH, KSH, ZSH, whatever, right? It's SU, <laughs> you know, and any actual programming languages too, because those those can again cough up shells. You know, cough up shells, cough up functionality. Um, those are pretty big got gimmies. You know, and so then we go, this is kind of like a little bit higher. We're cr turning up the volume, you know, on the uh, on the creativity a little bit, right? And so you have, look, um, you got commands, right? And then so you're not, they don't give you, they can't give you instant shells, but it's not right off the bat. So you got to dig for, dig for stuff a little bit and you have to use stuff unintended. You know, you got to think outside the box. And so... That's why I think that's why I kind of like some of these. And so here are a few examples. When you do w get right, for instance, if you supply i as an input file, it'll tip to read each line in that file as uh, as its own URL and it'll tend to shoot it. So if you do sudo w get whatever, let's say Etsy shadow, right? Each line of Etsy shadow is going to be w get's going to try to resolve or make a request to each line of Etsy shadow. I mean, it'll fail, but that's that's file read, right? you're now reading sensitive files that you're not supposed to, you know, and uh, same thing with curl. And uh, this one's actually kind of cool. These are two web requests applications and you don't even have to make an actual web request for them really, you know, you, <laughs> so it's kind of neat. And so you continue to offset and then it'll automatically find where to resume and you basically specify the, uh, the remote name which is local. And so then you specify file, it actually accepts in this in this uh, format here, file, you know, kind of like you're doing FTP or whatever, or HTTP. Um, no, the, the location on the local system and it'll download it and you can just, and you can read it. It's actually pretty neat. Uh, base64 is another interesting sample. That's file read. I think it does file write also, I'll have to double check. But essentially, right, uh, you're looking at, you know, that's file read. And if you pipe it into itself and supply the D flag, you know, you have the clear text. Uh, you have it un 64 And then GCC, uh, if you supply wrappers, right, it'll, uh, uh, it'll run the command that you, that you supply. And all, are, and all uh, params are passed comma separated after the initial uh, command. You know, and this kind of, and then at the very end, we're tagging along. Let's say you have kind of a kind of a bug, or like a big gaping kind of bug thing, right? And you know, it this kind of it's kind of a mix between the high level and the low level. But any bugs, right, that are incurred at sudo are going to have sudo consequences, also. So, uh -huh, where's my demo thing? Okay, so. Uh, we will do some shell time. How about this? So L section one, open sudo. So yeah, sudo L, right? 
anything, you do sudo su cat root root text. That's what it looks like. That's what I'm using for this particular uh, for these particular purposes. Looks like that kind of jazz, right? So app sudo l. And so this is pretty much the same thing too. Uh, if you run sudo is any of the top two, you're going to get an instant shell. Uh, creatively, uh, I think it's the kind of neat one and one that you can use for if you're working, trying to get a non-limited shell is with the Python. And so you, Python and most interpreted kind of languages and some things except inline commands, correct? So for pity, pity spawn, pity the fool bash right and so then your root it's uh pretty cut and dry it was a pretty pretty straightforward so now we're getting into a little bit more fun stuff with wget and whatnot so the uh so if you notice it accepts an input file and and so that basically that's what it looks like it tried to run the flag in our particular case as it, you know, it tried to make a request to it and it obviously it's going to fail because it's, it's not, it's nothing. Right. And so that's pretty, that was pretty neat when I first learned that. Right. And so base 64, uh, similar thing, similar thing. This was good. Okay. Uh, it comes in as you basically piping it to itself and you specifying the D which means decode. Uh, so here we go. Wrapper. We have got root. It runs ran uh, it ran sh. And then last and lastly for this little bit, curl. So it literally downloads and the spot like into the local directory. We've got the flag. Bada bing, bada boom. And so. So in this particular instance, uh, it's just a small program, say MyCap, right? Just to show an example. Obviously, um, and didn't mention this before, but as we progress along, you'll see a common trend of applications having more than one exploitation vector, right? So it may not it may not just be file read. It may can do file write. It may be able to do uh, commands, right? Is this depending on you know? It depends on how you how you work it. And whatnot. And so, in this particular case, it's the uh, you know it basically takes in through standard input and sends that to system, right? So there's two, you know, at least two with this one. So I do sudo mycat do root root text, right? File read, sensitive file read. But you can also right bin sh get root. Typical uh, you know string exploitation. Hmm. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna get a little bit fun now. So pager abuse. Where are my okay? Oh, those got mixed up. Okay, so pagers. So whenever you run man or service or any kind of any kind of uh, terminal editor, and those things where you can scroll up, down, left, right, <laughs> you know, those that's a it's called a terminal pager. And um the interesting thing is that people know what it is, but they don't know what it, it is per se. But it's basically what happens behind the scenes is a terminal pager gets gets called, and in this and they accept uh, they accept extra commands when you supply an exclamation mark. Anything proceeding that exclamation mark gets run gets run as a command. So your editors, you know, Vim, Nano, etc., and and so, yeah, we'll go ahead and show that for right quick, like L section two pagers. If I can type, clear sudo L. So, yeah, if I do sudo man man, quick example, we're now in a terminal pager. You can go up, down, left, right, whatever. By simply just typing stuff, it'll start parsing your input. And by doing exclamation mark, everything after this will be ran as a system command. 
So bin sh, or now root, etc. You know, and um, same thing with service too. So sudo service uh, blank status to get I'm gonna get all of them, and then kind of open up a pager. Same thing. Bin sh, easy peasy. And so a neat thing is I it didn't occur. It, you tend to forget these kinds of types of things. But let's say you do a service, but it doesn't have that particular, you know, much output. It's not really a, you know, it's more just kind of terminal fundamentals, of perhaps. Let's say you do cron status, right? And actually, the, it does do a pager right there midway. But if you, for whatever reason, if the pager ends prematurely, let's say if it finishes, you can always just shrink your freaking terminal down to like here, you know, and then do it again, and you'll, and it'll, uh, it'll open up the pager for you. So I think that's kind of neat. Okay. So, yes, get the GTFO bins. A lot of these are on GTFO bins. Now I tried not to just go down and just start listing them off. I try to grab a variety of different things, but uh, so yeah. The GTFO bins is definitely very, very handy. I, if you're not using that, you're definitely crippling yourself in what you can do. Okay, cron abuse. So this kind of goes without saying. Um, if you can edit, if you can manipulate or run or do some or do any kind of service types of things uh, as as root, that's going to have root like implications, you know. And so that's pretty. Uh, that's one thing. That's a pretty short slide. But so sudo l or s u l sorry section three cron l yeah and so in this particular instance right um, and so it's actually worth noting that if you do cron tab you know if you haven't done it before in the system and you don't have and you don't have the right environmental variable set what's the first thing it asks you it asks you what editor edit would you like to use and so then you have editor you know, ed editor styled exploits in with whatever kind of services you can you can do also. So in this particular case, uh, sudo l. So let's, say, let's do sudo cron tab e, and I already have something set up. But now we're in we're in freaking vim, right? So any kind of easy peasy. But you could also, it's also the implication that you can edit the root, the roots cron tab and run stuff as root, any kind of services. In this particular case, I have this little script here and all it does is, just for the example, uh, it basically reads in root texts and writes it to the current directory. It's pretty uh, easy peasy. So sudo service cron start. And you'd have to wait a minute. And let me see what's going on on the Discord. Okay. So at some point, probably in a minute, I might not. I might not just wait for it. But uh, we'll see. Root root text should uh, hopefully populate up here. But I don't think I'll wait for that. So you'll have to deal with it. Okay. So now we're getting into a little bit more fun stuff. Uh, LD preload is actually kind of neat. So, and you need a bit of a background to understand what's going on. So LD preload, um, it's it's uh, an exploit. Ex you're abusing a feature that is intended to be used with dynamically linked ex uh, binaries. Uh, whereas with, stat you know, all the... You know, all the methods and all the stuff is resolved at runtime, whereas the statically linked, you know, you get that bigger file if you statically link everything, but you have you don't have to worry about shared objects, you know, being all messed up and whatever. You have everything in one nice big package, you know, but uh, this gives you, but obviously with dynamic linking, you know, you do have a smaller file size uh, and, you, and you have some, you have your typical, like your libc and a bunch of other things to worry about. But I mean, overall, it's a little bit, a little bit more flexible. Uh, and so, with the LD preload, is actually uh, you could essentially 
tell it to load that stuff before it loads the other stuff, right? And so you can essentially overwrite any kind of method or function in in whatever application you're running, you know. And then so we need to put a little two put put a few things together. You're combining a custom functionality with a binary that's being run as pseudo, you know, and obviously that's going to equal fun. <laughs> Pretty fun. You know, and so and you'll see this in the environment whenever you uh, and these are the whenever I've seen it, it's been in the in the environment. Uh, and the binary also has to be compiled for it. Um, and so the syntax for when you want to do go about business with this is sudo ld preload. You you specify you can you can you can make it a uh, in, in you can export it to the to the env to your environmental variables, or you can just run it all one like how we're about to do here in a minute. So demo. So L section four L E preload query. So in this particular case, uh, we can run the example. And I've, I tried to cite, I got some of these examples straight off the internet. I tried to cite them. You can find these, I'll link to them. So if you want to look at them, reference them too. Um, so in this particular case, the example was, it's a, uh, it runs a loop and it prints 10 random numbers. It calls rand and it, and it outputs the standard out 10 numbers. So in this particular case, because it's a dynamically linked, right, we can provide our own stuff and we have the, in, the LD preload uh, environment, environmental variable set. So in this particular case, cat D random, and basically it's going to overwrite the rand function and it'll just return 42. So example C, Right here, right, and so it's, you're basically going to make you're essentially you're going to make that do what you want it to, which is kind of which is kind of cool. So for this particular example, uh, so where are we at? one moment, please. I have that up here. Oh, where? So sudo ld preload. D, uh, let's see, what is this? D random, random shared object to example. And as you see, uh, we basically made random do what the, what we want to. So it's no longer random. It just prints 1042s instead of a bunch of actual random. So taking that a step further, oh, oh we can manipulate the file as sudo. So what do we do? we get evil, you know? And in this particular case, we're overriding init, which happens right off the bat. And, you know, we basically pop shell. And so using a similar type thing, evil, we are now root. It's pretty cool. And another cool thing is that it will finish running the rest of the application when, once we exit, see? Because we, we only overwrote in it, we didn't overwrite the rest of it. So it's kind of neat. Okay, okay. Okay. Installers. So so it goes without saying, right, that installing any kind of application uh, is a security concern, especially if you're going to install it as admin, as root, any kind of privileged accounts, right? And so uh, these can definitely be leveraged in various kinds of ways. Uh, pip, app, git, dpackage, you name it. Um, and so like, for instance, a lot of these have multiple, let's say app, git, and you know, dpackage. They both, use, they both invoke a pager. Uh, you can do stuff during install, uh, providing custom functionality. Uh, for, for example, pip, uh, when you run setup high or when it's set up, you can specify entire methods for doing stuff. So. You know, you, becomes your oyster. So obviously installing things, right, as brute is a big uh, critical security con uh, consideration. Okay, we will hit that up. Let's see. L section five, oh, installer, sorry. 
Okay, so pseudo L. Okay, so how does one make that a shared object? Uh, I, you compile and link. You basically don't do a full compile. You don't do the full process when you compile. Uh, and we can pull, I'm sure if somebody doesn't share that with you, we can grab that uh, here after this. But basically, you make it a share. You make it a shared object, and it can be used by other dynamic, other other uh, dynamically linked uh, applications. So let me grab my thing. All right, quick kill. Okay, so for for the pager, right? Pager abuse, pseudo app get. Oh, my bad. Change log. See, we now have a, we now have a pager, so to, the old stuff still applies, right? And so having that kind of mentality that oh yeah we're in familiar territory, right? It'll help us for later on, right? And so in in this example we have uh, app get shell package, and all it's doing uh, you're basically providing custom functionality, and it runs uh, at the very end. So all you got to do, you can just specify, uh, you, instead of making a normal web request out, you specify a local file for which to draw from, and then it basically goes like that. That's pretty cool. So, and the same thing with uh, when you go to setup, or setup, uh, excuse me, pip. So, in this particular case, we have a setup py like what you'd see in any kind. If you're installing any kind of module, any kind of thing written in Python or whatever, you'll have your setup py, right? And in this particular case, it actually does a reverse shell. And so I'm going to use, I need to split screen for a minute. I think that one was one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five. Uh, if we do sudo pip install dot from the dot to specify from the local directory and we do and we have bada bing right pretty cool exit exit all that all that jazz okay right on right on so see path and secure path so the these, so if you recall back, right, uh, globs and whatnot, you know, are are acceptable within the pseudo res file. To include, you know, uh, the asterisk, star, whatever is what are more question marks, new characters, and so on. So, and this is kind of in the same family as your normal environmental variable path, right? It's it's in the same vein of exploitation. If the if you see asterisks. You know, you see stars in the Sudovers file, you can have similar consequences too. So um, it's kind of similar in this particular case. Not exactly, but for, for example, if you see a dot in env, it's going to read from your, the current directory first, wherever it's being invoked, and then it goes on, right? It goes on down the line, right? And if you see an asterisk, that means anything for that directory. And so that, that's what's happening in this particular case. You know, anything in bin, you know, is free game. And so obviously that's not particularly secure. And so and so, interesting enough, uh, for pseudoers, right, you have the secure path. So if you don't actually trust uh, like the environmental variables at the lower level uh, to be like well-formed or whatever, or to be secure, you can kind of override that with your own secure path. You know, but obviously if the secure path is misconfigured, <laughs> you know, that's fun for more, more than one person involved. So and in this particular example, uh, we made secure path temp to show that's kind of a misconfiguration of sorts. So L section six path. I believe for this one I'm doing the bin. Yeah. So and it's and also it's also worth noting, right, and other kind of privilege escalation mindset that uh you know, I could run anything in this directory. And so as sudo, 
so you can basically write your own ship. You can do whatever, and it'll do. You know, it'll run what you want. So in this particular case, I just made ID. It runs shell. It's weird, but whatever. <laughs> you know, and so sudo. Let me copy all that. I ain't typing that stuff. Boom. ID. Now we have shell. Pretty. Uh, it's pretty. Pretty intuitive. And then sudo l. So this particular one, um, it's going to check. It's going to check temp first because that's a misconfiguration on the secure path. And it's a particular one. And there's actually another exploit later on that utilizes double stars. But this is for the example, this purposes. You know, what, where is usually where is ping usually at? Ping is usually user bin, right? But obviously, if we do sudo temp and ahead of time, it's a temp uh, to ping, right, you get the flag because that, in that particular file, uh, it does the same thing. It's just reading and printing, right? And so that's just insecure path considerations when you're using uh, globs and whatnot. Okay. So... We're getting there. We are getting there. Okay, so this one's kind of neat. So editors and pseudo edit. So you have your obvious kind of blatant stuff. You or you got your pager or whatnot. And anything with editors, you have file read, file write, any kind of commands. But how it does some things are kind of weird, right? And so I'm gonna, and there's a few new things I stumbled upon while I was, make, while I was even making this, uh, you know, in the, in the past months. So. Um, and we'll, we will include an actual CVE with this also, because it's kind of in the same line of things. And so, and this is the actual CVE, it's on uh, exploit DB. Um, pseudo edit does not check uh, the, you know, the full path. So if you use double globs, so, and so the POC for this is you create a sim link to anything, anything sensitive, right? Anything sensitive and uh, you know, it, it'll resolve that as correct and it'll run it you know, and you're good. It's pretty cool. So we will get to keyboard mashing. L section seven, edit cores, clear. Pseudo L. Um, okay, so we can do that one first. So in this particular example, we have two, di two directories, test, test two with protected, which is the actual sim link to it. That is a, uh, it's going to Etsy shadow right now. Um, and then we have, let me scooch that up a little bit for us here. There we go. All right. And so var, I just got, I just made some durs and this one is, it's actually really nothing. Uh, I think it has some stuff on it. I forget what I put on there, but either way, the user can't access either of them because they are, you know, it does not have the permissions. All right. But, so if I were to do sudo, sudo edit, right, and then specify uh, test, test to protected. Oops. So uh, it's worth, it is worth noting that if you fat finger something, you fat finger it, <laughs> you know, um, you, it, it will ask you for a password. So if you so if you specify no password on a on a security policy and whatever you're doing is prompting you for a password, then that action is not covered under the policy, and you're likely not going to be able to do it. Hmm. Might sudo edit. There we go. Okay, and so now we are in Etsy Shadow. I must have been fat fingering something. So, and so this next example is actually kind of cool. So, so we have this entry right here. It's no password. So they're trying to lock us down to them, but they also have no exec. And so if we recall what no exec is, it means no shells, or you can't run commands. You especially can't pop shells, right? 
and they are trying to lock us down to where we can only edit this particular file, which doesn't exist, but that's what, but you can obviously open it. You can create the file and then save or do whatever in them. So, suit, and we'll test that theory, right? Sudo vim, let's say you try, we want to do root.txt, right? Can't do it because we're being prompted by a password. Let's say if we do sudo vim, and we actually do go to this, um, right? So obviously, and if we try to do our typical shenanigans, right? Nope, denied, no shell for you, right? It's pretty cool, but, 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 but here's a neat trick. You can, you can source externally from within editors to, uh, to doing your own stuff. So colon E for edit, R for write, for read, right? Exactly. So I think that's pretty neat. And then you can basically get, you can basically kind of like wiggle around from inside kind of like that. Okay. We are hooking and jabbing. We got a couple more and then we are Dunskis. So PW feedback. This is this one is an actual uh, this is also an actual CVE and has an exploit DB entry. Um, so basically, in older renditions of sudo, it'll ask you for you know your password. But when you supply stuff via standard input, it gives little it gives little stars. And essentially, there is a stack based up buffer overflow. It's too many you know too much uh, too much input with uh, through standard input and you supply a long enough of a string, you can then put in whatever malicious badness, goodness that you want. And so, and it's actually pretty, uh, I mean, it's pretty self, it's actually pretty simple exploit, you know, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty simple to check out. And we will go ahead and, and do that. However, I need to see what user, one second, I need to get, what I call these, because I don't call them all intuitive names per se. Eight. Well, that one is. Okay. Okay. PW feedback, right? So sudo l. Uh, in this particular case, we do. Yeah. See, we do need it this time. We do need it. The prompt is for a password, so we can actually exploit. Uh, you know, the, we can smash the stack basically. Uh, and so, and it, I have two POCs, and then I think ones you can find it on, uh, I think I'll link to at least one of these. They're pretty self-explanatory. So this first one, it's, I mean, 100 days, it's uh, 100 days terminated by a null, and it does this 50 times. And then after that, you can pipe in whatever stuff, you know, whatever commands you want, generally speaking, after the S. And so... So for instance, uh, if I were to do sudo, actually, POC, rear root, right? And notice in here, we're not actually supplying a password because it, it, it did ask us for a password, right? So if we do sudo whatever, it, it asks us for a password and we had to supply it. But because we smashed the stack basically and then supplied our own command, that's basically how we went, we went out of business there. And the same thing with POC2 is the same concept. It's just more fanciness. In that case, it does a reverse shell, you know, like before. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to go ahead and, yeah, we can do that one too. Why not? Why not? Tmux. Okay, this one was three, four. POC2. Hmm. That's curious. Oh my God. Well, they almost, they all almost worked. Hmm. I have to, I have to fuck with that later, but, if it, but I'll get the general principle. Exit. 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 Demo gods. So, okay, limited shells. This one's, this one's actually pretty neat. And I learned this actually doing by doing Pentester Academy, you know? And so 
And if you're trying to look for different neat kind of ways to enhance your, your existing uh, skill set, right, or learn completely new things, I, I highly encourage that. You know, I'm not trying to sh I'm not trying to show for Pentester Academy or Vivek, but I mean, he's a great instructor and they have some great coursework. And so in this particular one, just just showing this particular example. Uh, and it's kind of a hypothetical too, right? So you you say you have a particular you have a, you have users credentials. You can do suit normally you would be able to do pseudo as a user, but you do not have a full TTY. Let's say for whatever reason you can't make a full TTY, you can't do the SOCAT, the STTY raw echo trick. You know, all those normal things, let's say it's not, those aren't working, but you still have a limited shell and you have the ability to run sudo because you can run sudo and you have the user's credentials, right? So you can use, in this example, the expect command, right? And the expect command basically simulates user interactivity. Uh, and command, you know, on the map page, they're listed alphabetically, but there's always, there's four of them that you would practically really need to know if you in order to run this example. Uh, spawn, which spawns the command of whatever you supply. Uh, send is providing input to standard input. Expect parses, uh, I think it does both standard out and standard error. Uh, I haven't tested that, but I think it does. Does both, at least does standard out. And then you have interact. And then that basically goes hand on, it's hands on for, at that point, it's kind of like uh, if you ever used Poem Tools with Python, right? It's like the interactive, similar, similar kind of mentality there. And so I'll break that. I'll break this down. Expect C, you're supplying the command. You then spawn sudo s. So it's kind of like a spawn, the spawn, the spawn thing, right? Sudo s. In this case, we're gonna we're just going to uh, read root.txt. You know, we spawn that process. It then we then look for with globs, it, it supports globbing too. So you don't have to be exact exactly. You can, a little bit of wiggle room when you're you're doing your expect uh, or look for password because that's typically what you see whenever you're prompted, you know, by sudo. We will provide the password, you know, and, which in this case, it's always the username because for demo examples, you, have to, you do have to provide your own enter um, and then you interact. So demo. Okie dokie. And this one will require a limited shell or will require a reverse. Uh, I think it's one, three, four, five. I forget. Four, five. Okay. So in this case, I made a shitty little, didn't really make. Oh, it's one, two, three, four. I'm sorry. Four. So it's a little crummy shell. You can't do anything. You don't have an environment. There's no terminal. There's no nothing. It's bare bones. What you might see, it's what you might see if you're doing a CTF, a real life pen test, you know, where you don't actually have functionality or, you know, it's this, it's a limited shell, a limited shell, is a limited shell, right? No, you, you got nothing really per se. So in this particular instance, we will then, we can then supply the big glob that we had previously. And so hit enter and there's our flag. Okay. So we're at the finish line now. And this one's actually a pretty quick one and it's, a, and it's more recent too. Um, this one, is it doesn't check for the existence of a user. And so when it runs, uh, it, it executes with the arbitrary user ID uh, and it returns at zero. Zero is also roots ID, right? And so, and then it matches executor for privileges or whatever you specify on the end of it. And you can test that out too, because if you specify, see as the, in the as whom clause of this user spec, you could specify you can't run stuff as root, for instance, right? And so this particular one, I actually do need to copy and paste my username because the it's not as intuitive. 
Okay, pseudo L, right. So generally speaking, if I try to do anything either not as this particular application or if I try to do that, but as root, it's obviously not going to work because this is, it is explicitly stated in the user spec. However, given this particular type of pseudo, uh, you don't have to worry about that, right? And so let me get, excuse me while I whip that out. Okay. So yeah, you simply just do sudo you, and there's tons of scripts too, where you basically scrape the, you scrape the internet looking for this pretty, uh, pr they're pretty nifty. So if I try, well, if I try to run anything other than those two, you'll get prompted by password, which means, uh, you know, given that there's no password, if you see it asking for password, you're wrong. So we'll just do ID and we're root. We at least have the roots UID. And if we do bash, we are now root. Okay, that is good. So a recap, we, we covered sudo, sudoers. You know, uh, we went through open, sudo, we covered a bunch of easier application stuff. Uh, that's out of, this is out of order a little bit, disregard it. <laughs> no, uh, and so, so yeah, we covered a variety of things uh, from different angles, from, from GTFO bins to some CVEs, from stuff from exploit DB. Um, and just try to develop the whole mindset, right? That, you know, you can really dig into pseudo and get creative and really have fun, <laughs> really have fun with it. And so I tried to cite as much pop, I tried to cite everything that I could that I pull from, and I included that, that at the very end. Um, if you happen to see your material featured in here and, and I did not give you proper citation, just let me know and I'll add it. Uh, I'm not trying to plagiarize your stuff. You know, I try to give all the citation credit where it is due. And that is my talk. Okay, do we have any questions? Awesome. I was trying to get the mute button working, but uh, yeah, ba basically, um, First of all, thank you so much for supporting us and for the great presentation here. Um, we're accepting questions through Discord. And if you just join us in, on the, in the bottom of the screen, there should be, whether you're on Twitch or YouTube, there should be a link to our website. And of course, from there, you can actually get to our Discord channel. So if you have any questions for Tyler, uh, please do so there. Um, we're going to go in a brief break, and then the next presenter will start in about 15 minutes. Thank you again.